Hello everyone and welcome to our first ever NAPIT Trade Association webinar. I'm Charlotte Lee, Public Affairs Manager for NAPIT and today I'm going to be joined by Paul Markham, Senior Training Lecturer for NAPIT Training and Dave Scully, Regional Inspections Manager for the NOR, who will be presenting on Electrical Installation Condition Reports, their purpose, value, codes and they'll also be providing a few tips on how to complete them accurately. There will be a couple of polls throughout the presentation to encourage audience um, interaction and there will be time for questions at the end. Uh, so please send them in by the tab on the right hand side of your screen um, and we will address, address all of the ones that we've got time for. Uh, there will also be a short survey at the end of the webinar and we'd really welcome um, you, your feedback on how it went today and whether you'd be interested in attending another webinar of this, of this kind. Um, so, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dave and Paul, who will get the webinar started. Hello, I'm David Scully, the Regional Inspections Manager for the North. And I'm Paul Markham, I'm the Senior Lecturer at Mansfield. Uh, today, we, uh, we're going to start another presentation on electric. The electrical installation condition reporting coding, uh, and um, this is our presentation for that. First of all, the purpose. Purpose is basically down to what the regs state: safety of persons and livestock against the effects of electric shock and burns, uh, the protection against damage by fire to the property, uh, and any damage or deterioration that you notice through the inspection needs to be reported. Uh, also, defects and non-compliance from the current edition of BS7671. Always the current edition uh, that we make the uh, observations to, which may give rise to danger and therefore make the property unsafe for continued use. And that's the main idea of it. The necessity for periodic inspection and testing comes from legislation in the Electricity at Work Regulations 1989, Regulation 42. Additional requirements could come from licensing authorities, public bodies, insurance companies, or mortgage lenders, or any company of a similar sort of um, stature. In addition to the above points, other possible reasons could include a change of occupancy, a change of use to a property, any alterations or additions to the installation, significant change in the loading, and where there is reason to believe that damage may have been caused from lightning strikes or flooding or anything of that nature. The SM671 asks for inspection and testing. Inspection is the main part of the process. Testing is done to back up that inspection process. Guidance Note 3 asks for a detailed examination of installation with no dismantling or partial dismantling. The more that people take to pieces, the more faults they're liable to put back onto the installation uh, when they start to reinstate. It's the inspector's judgment as to how far they need to go to get the judgment that they need to find. The testing is done in a considered appropriate manner. It is not necessarily to the schedule that you would follow for initial verification. The testing is done to an installation that is mainly live and energized. So it is up to the inspector to ensure that they uh, put the testing procedures in place that they need to to ensure that the installation is safe. For any rented domestic and residential accommodation, the Landlord and Tenant Act 1985 requires that rented property is, uh, well basically it's safe for when a tenancy begins, <clears throat> and also that the installation is maintained and in a safe condition throughout the entirety of the tenancy. Although there is no specific mention of a need to carry out AICRs in the Act, um, an AICR would be a practical way of identif identifying any potential remedial works 
and what works would be required in order to keep the installation in a safe condition. Obviously, NAPIT have their forms that we use based on the documentation in Appendix 6 of the regulations. Uh, our electrical installation condition report is the one that is used, obviously, for periodic inspection and testing of all installations. <coughs> The EICR observation sheet is used to record any defects within the installation. Uh, these observations should then be assigned the appropriate code. Now, uh, as you can see, we've got a list of the codes there. So a C1 or C2 would indicate an unacceptable condition. C3 would be an improvement required. FI is further investigation, which would again leave the report as unsatisfactory. And you have additional options such as not verified, limitation, or not applicable. So the C1s. Reading the regs, immediate remedial action required. And basically speaking, it means death the minute you touch it. Anything that would cause a danger to life at that time should be recorded as a code C1. Some examples are obviously exposed life parts any fuse carriers emitted from distribution boards, consume units, uh, any damaged insulation to cables leaving the conductors exposed, uh, and any signs of thermal distress caused by loose connections that obviously could lead to fires and the likes. In the picture shown on screen, it basically it's showing an old wireless consume unit with the fuse carrier missing. Uh, with the fuse carrier missing, this is that then causing an exposed conductive part. Also, to the far side of the picture, you can see that insulation tape uh, <coughs> has been used to prevent direct contact to an exposed conductive part. Uh, this is a not a suitable method of pre preventing direct contact, and suitable blanks should be used to ensure safety. This is obviously shown in this picture. Uh, this is wrapping tape, packing tape used to secure the live terminals of a double socket, as you can see. It's in a really poor state. This has got, in no way, is going to make sure that people can't touch these uh, exposed terminals. Uh, it's easy to push your fingers through this stuff. Uh, and obviously, even if it was PVC tape, it would not be sufficient. Uh, these pictures uh, show cables that have been either extended or repaired with the use of connector blocks. Now the top picture shows an exposed conductive part with metallic trunking, which would be listed as a code one because there is direct contact to the uh, terminals. The below picture shows the use of connector blocks wrapped in insulation tape. Whilst this is not the preferred method to join a cable, because there is no direct contact to the terminals, you would list this as a code 2. The next picture shows uh, what can happen through overloading. Again, the inspector should uh, use their knowledge and experience of being able to identify problems or problems that could arise uh, just by walking around the installation and, and asking a few questions of the occupants. Uh, seeing the, uh, the picture on the left is evident that uh, there's not enough sockets available, there's not enough power outlets, therefore people are overloading. And of course, uh, the picture on the right could be the end result. Uh, burning of these sockets uh, could cause fires. Today's modern materials, of course, don't just burst into flames spontaneously. Uh, we all know that. But a, a socket such as this, placed behind a sofa in a lounge with two electric fires uh, working off it, could easily set fire to the surrounding area uh, and the sofa back. Once again, this picture is showing the use of connector block. Now, in this instance, the connector block has been used uh, behind a light fitting. And as you can see, either through loose connections or the exposed parts, uh, burning has occurred in the lighting transformer, which again, above the ceiling, nobody's to know until it's possibly too late. These pictures again show damage 
caused by somebody's use of, of the wrong type of plug in the socket. Uh, they've obviously not learned from the right hand side so they continue on the left hand side. It, it's external influences that are affecting this socket. The people are the external influences. They've damaged the socket to such an extent that it's very dangerous. Shock could ensue. C1. Uh, the, the picture below that is the inside obviously of a distribution board and it's fairly obvious that the, the terminal uh, is showing signs of, of heat damage to the conductors. Uh, this is loose and of course again could cause a fire risk. Uh, and on the right hand side uh, a quick observation inside the, the false roof trap. Uh, just uh, an observation you could see things such as uh, you see here which is obviously rodent damage. Anybody entering the false roof crawling on their hands and knees in this situation could obviously get a, um, a severe shock from the exposed conductors. Once again, the condition of the installation may limit the extent of the testing that you wish to carry out. As you can see from the pictures in this slide, um, the use of connector block uh, for the installation, um, there's exposed conductive parts, uh, like we spoke about before, meter tails have not been secured, which again could lead to loose connections and potential burning. And also, in the top right picture, we have uh, potential uh, for electromagnetic effects. So again, you could possibly look at the installation as an inspection thing, it's failed, and that would limit the testing what you carry out. Proceed to. Reading the regs again, urgent remedial action required. Um, this really is a question of, in my opinion, death waiting to happen. As it stands, the installation would be safe, but if a problem developed in the future uh, without these things in place, then uh, obviously you could be putting somebody at risk. Such things are the separate protective de devices in line and neutral. Uh, losing the, the neutral would obviously give rise to people touching equipment that could still remain live. Waters, gas, oil, utility pipes are being used as the main earthing conductor, which again is, is not part of the regulations and they forbid it. Uh, no CPC for the lighting circuit that has class 1 equipment fitted. Uh, the class 1 equipment will still work, no problem. Uh, and as long as there's no fault developing, then there would be no problem. There is a problem, though, if a fault develops uh, and somebody decides to change the light fitting or touch the light fitting with a fault on, no CPC being present, they obviously become that earthing conductor. Any absence of reliable and effective means of earthing, if there's no earth, protective devices will not work. Main protective bonding conductors missing to metallic installation pipes. The pipe work will remain A-OK -okay for as long as there's no fault, but the minute a live conductor touches it, then obviously somebody could have a shock risk. Uh, and of course a TT installation with the high earth fault paths, resistive earth fault paths, and no RCD to, to take out the protective devices, then again you are putting people in possible danger. Other potential uh, code twos what you may come across could be a immersion heater not fitted with a thermal cutout, a socket outlet in a lo location containing a bath or shower fitted than less than three meters from zone one, so there's the potential for using a hairdryer while in the bath or anything uh, daft like that. No RCD for portable equipment that may be used outdoors. So again, if you was doing an EICR on, let's say, a block of flats, third floor flat, would, would the socket require RCD protection? Could that be used outdoors? So that would be down to your um, determination. A high earth fault loop impedance, or ZS. And cable insulation that has either been damaged or deteriorated, 
um, which like we saw in the previous photographs, and a location with a bath or shower with the absence of supplementary bonding and no RCD installed. Code C3, improvement recommended. A C3 doesn't necessarily fail the periodic inspection. It could pass as satisfactory. Uh, they are just improvements to the installation that is recommended for the customer to take on board. Such things as a voltage operated circuit breaker. Voltage operated circuit breakers are, are of a very old ilk uh, and really there are no test instruments available really to test them efficiently. The only way of testing these is with the test button and of course that test button must function. Any undersized main protective bonding conductors that are less than 6 mil cross-sectional area um, may get a good ZS uh, and therefore protective devices will operate. Uh, so again C3. Absence of RCD protection for cables buried within walls. C3 unless you can see damage to switch drops or the area surrounding switch drops if it's in a place where people have put drawing pins near the switch drop uh, somebody's going to drill holes for a shelf unit close to the switch drop they don't realize how close they are and that could determine whether it's a c2 but um, if you can't see any problems c3 absence of rcd protection for sockets which are unlikely to be used for portable equipment outdoors, uh, then again, as long as they aren't used outdoors, as long as they aren't in a bathroom or a shower room, uh, any place containing a bathroom or shower, then C3. Uh, a socket outlet mounted in a way that might result in damage to the plug or socket arrangement, uh, C3, unless you can see damage to the flex already. Uh, and any absence of labelling, your periodic inspection labels, your safety electrical connection, do not remove labels on BS951 earth clamps, it doesn't take away any of the safety, uh, but an improvement should be recommended. Uh, this picture shows a socket outlet that has bad, been located badly. Um, Again, it's bad working practice because, as you can see, due to the height of the socket from the worktop, uh, considerable, considerable uh, stress is being put on the plug top and the flex, which again could lead, lead to potential problems, but again it would be a C3. The new amendment of BSM 671 introduced code FI, further investigation. That doesn't mean to say that there are any new faults that have been unearthed that have never been coded before. It's just that this may need a little bit more investigation as to finding out why. A high ZE, when testing your ZE uh, at the property, uh, there could be a problem with the incoming supply and therefore further investigation needs to be brought to the customer's attention so they can contact the DNO to investigate it. An open ring circuit on one of the conductors, you know there's a problem. Where it is, uh, is sometimes hard to track down uh, and would require further investigation to do that. Unable to identify circuit breakers that isolate certain uh, pieces of equipment, you can spend time switching things off and if you can't see anything going dead and the customer is not aware of anything going off, uh, then again, further investigation to find out where the cable actually is terminated. Uh, borrowed neutrals can also be classified as further investigation. Uh, depends on how they run, depends on what problems it would give you. Other potential problems you may come across when carrying out an AICR, um, so such as a TNS system where a timber clamp has been used the main earth. Um, you may find that the connection is loose in itself. And as in the pitch to the right hand side, you can see one of the older service cutout fuses where there is actually a protective fuse for both the line and the neutral, which again, like we spoke about before, 
wouldn't be ideal. In these instances, you would be advised to contact the DNO. Now, one of the things NAPIT has also done is we've created some supplementary guidance on distribution services and the emergency codes and how they are explained. There's also a additional document on the reporting of issues within the distribution suppliers service equipment. If you were to look in the handout section on the webinar, these documents are available there for additional guidance for yourself. And I believe these documents would also be a bit available in the member download section on the NAPIT website. Here we have another problem. The electrical installation to the fan may very well be in a very good order. Uh, what worries me is the position of it. The position of it really does bring in question to me, the person who installed it in the first place. Uh, obviously, Ventilation comes under part F of the building regulations, uh, but as I say, further investigation could be put down because of the lack of knowledge of the installer of the fan. So the burning issue at this time is that consumer units in dwellings as of the 1st of January 2016 should be of a non-combustible materi material, I do apologise, or in a non-combustible enclosure. So as long as there are no signs of thermal damage and the incoming tails are fixed so as to prevent any movement which could result in loosening of the main terminals, then no code observation needs recording. Now, as you can see in the picture from the left hand on the left hand side, um, nice neat consumer unit, as you can see with the meter tails located in uh, trunking, so they're nice and secure. So another possible way of determining whether this would need a code re reason against it would be potentially the use of a thermal imaging camera, which would then show you any loose connections and so forth. As you can see from the picture on the right hand side, uh, no thermal imaging cameras used on this one. And as you can see, there was obviously an issue as it's gone up in flames and I think that that's all we need to say about that one really. Well, what we've got on the on the presentation at this present moment in time uh, is a picture as you can obviously see. We've actually got a picture here that has four problems with it uh, and we have uh, a poll now for you to, to have a go at, at seeing if you can come up with what uh, code you would give to these these problems. The first one, as you will obviously see, is that the protective bonding conductor is connected to the incoming service and not to the customer's installation pipeline. So maybe we could have your ideas of what code you would put onto it. Great. So. Thanks, Paul and Dave. So this is our first um, poll of the evening. Um, and just to remind you, what code would you give to the protective bonding conductor being connected to the wrong pipe? And we can see that we, uh, we're getting a good response. 55% uh, have voted so far. So we'll give it a couple more seconds. Going up, that's great. So which code would you give to the protective bonding conductor being connected to the wrong pipe? Great, right, that's lots of you, so we'll, uh, we'll close that poll down now. Right then, well, it's an interesting poll, I must admit. Just over 50% are saying that we have a, a C2 code, which is interesting, um, personally. Uh, the best way of working on it to me would be to do a continuity test between the two pipes. If you've got uh, zero ohms between the incoming service and the installation pipe, really, uh, there's a connection there. At the most, to me, my opinion, C3. Uh, and uh, also, in my opinion, it's a quick job just to swap that from one pipe to another. The second one. 
no label on the BS951 earth clamping. Now it wouldn't matter whether it was on the incoming service or it was on the installation pipe, there is no label. It does not comply to BS7671, so maybe we could have your your um, opinions on your codes here, please. Great, thanks Paul. So we've just launched the second poll, um, and just to remind you, what code, if any, would you give to the lack of the appropriate labelling? Fab, you're a lot quicker this time. That's fantastic. Just getting up to 100%. A couple more seconds for the final voters. Great, thank you. We'll close that poll down now. Yeah, a resounding, overwhelming C3. Uh, personally, I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, I really do see that as a C3. It, it is in no way dangerous in any way, shape, or form. It's just a non-compliance and doesn't make the, the installation any less safe just because it's not got a label on it. The next one. Uh, the protective conductor, although not easy to see from a photograph, is only 6 millimeter squared cross-sectional area. So, again, uh, we'll have your opinions on what counts. Great, so the third poll, we've just la launched the third one. Um, so what code, if any, would you give to the incorrect cross-sectional area of the protect protective bonding conductor? Give you a couple more seconds. Looking like a close one, this one. Right, Fab, I will close that poll down. We've got a great uh, response. Yeah, we've uh, got a large response for C3, which, again, yeah, I can, I can see that point most definitely. Uh, a few people have put further investigation, which, which, yeah, I find very interesting because it would depend on, on a lot of things. It would depend, firstly, on the type of earthing arrangement you've got, whether it's TNS, TNCS. Obviously, with a TNCS system, we have the prospective fault currents able to reach a much higher level, uh, and this conductor needs to be able to take those prospective fault current levels. Uh, it's a possibility that you could do a calculation, uh, the adiabatic equation, to prove that one it was it was okay. Uh, at the time, I must agree, C threes is probably uh, the code that would I would go with here. Yeah. And the last one, it's obviously that the protective conductor was installed long before the new colour codes came out, and it is only a green colour, not a green and yellow. Uh, so again, just a, a quick um, opinion on what your codes would be. Great, thanks Paul. So the final code for the evening, um, it will sign a poll, sorry, is what code, if any, would you give to the incorrect colour of the protective bonding conductor? Give you a couple more seconds to, uh, to give us your codes for this. Right, I'll close that one down. Right, a good percentage, you've actually said uh, no code. Again, uh, I would agree with that. You don't need to code the fact that colour codes don't comply. The colour of the conductor doesn't make any difference as to how it will operate. Uh, but it does show from the polls we've had, I must admit, uh, and how people sometimes can have different opinions of, of how they observe these things. Questioning can also come in handy. Please always question the, um, the occupants of the, of the installation. They are the ones that use it. They can answer a lot of questions. How is the grass cut? Where do you plug the lawnmower into? Things like that. Uh, as for the codes themselves, are they important? Yes, they are. I think what's more important is that you've actually noticed it and you've actually put it down and that you've actually brought it to the attention of the customer so that they are in the also able to make a decision on whether they will get it fixed or not, uh, and your advice will help in this. 
So, as a summary, the person responsible for carrying out periodic inspection work shall be a skilled, competent person in the type of electrical installation being inspected. Uh, this will enable them to work safely and correctly assess the condition of an installation. Now, obviously, if your main field of work is in domestic work, you may not be comfortable carrying out a periodic inspection report on a um, industrial unit, and so on and so forth. So, again, it is it is down to you to de decide where you're, how comfortable you are in that line of work. And an EICR is an assessment carried out against the requirements of the current edition of BS 7671, including any amendments with recommendations as appropriate to the installations used, use and the external influences exerted upon it. So it is entirely a matter for the inspector who is carrying out the periodic inspection and test to decide on the recommendation code of any particular observation. Uh, as long as that person has uh, substantial evidence to be able to bring to the customer's attention and say, well, this is this, this is that, uh, then the codes uh, do play a part in that. Further to the, the presentation which is online, you'll find that we do, as David said earlier, have some uh, uh, downloads that you can use and some handouts that you'll see available as PDF documents uh, in the panel to your right hand side. These can be printed off. Uh, we do have the supplementary guide as David said. On there you'll also find the ZS values chart. Uh, there is also a, a code breakers PDF uh, which is actually uh, a been used in one of our competent person magazines previously. Uh, and also guidance on reporting for the distribution business service equipment and how to get in touch with the DNO uh, and make that job a lot easier. Um, due to um, increasing drive for regular periodic, in, periodic inspection and testing and the use of electrical installation condition reports, more employers, employers sorry, and landlords have an obligation to ensure safety of systems and electrical equipment in their property. As a result of this, uh, NAPIT are releasing a electrical inspector scheme which so long as you have all the relevant qualifications and the relevant insurances you are welcome to join up, join up for and you can sign on that you carry out condition reports on domestic installations, commercial installations and industrial. So again, that's down to you to tell us what line of work you carry out. As a result of this, um, any customers who are looking for an electrician to carry out a condition report can do so by searching the NAPIC website and filling in the required fields. This will then bring you up as a um, registered member for carrying out this line of work. Really, uh, it's it's any questions time. We'd like to thank everybody for attending, obviously. Uh, and if anybody's got any questions that they would like to ask uh, in the period we've got left, then uh, please do so. Great, thank you very much, Paul and Dave. So um, I do have a couple of questions that have been coming in throughout the, the session for you. Um, the first one is regarding um, ring circuit. So um, the member has asked, as you know, testing these can be a real pain in cramped and confused consumer units, as it can be very difficult to tell which, circuits is, which circuit is which, e.g. neutrals and earths in an old Wilex. Have you come across any disadvantages to testing ring continuity and R1 plus R2 from a convenient double socket? Um. Ultimately, there wouldn't be any issue with carrying out these tests at a socket outlet on the circuit. An additional thing that you would need to ensure that you do is on the observations section, record that um, or any neutral or earthing conductors are incorrectly referenced, and this would more than likely go down as an FI for further investigation. 
um, because obviously it needs to be sorted out and it, it's not it's not ideal. Yeah, I, I really can't add anything more to that. Further investigation on the the existing consumer unit is more more the problem. The the testing of the ring final circuit can be done uh, as stated by the, the questioner. Uh, at any convenience of it, that would give you the readings that you require, yeah. Great, so uh, the second question um, that we've got is from um, Angus, who's asking, was the picture of the distribution board which has clear signs of overheating on the wire a code one or a code two? Personally, I would put it down as probably a C1 uh, in the fact that it is it is going to lead to more. As it stands, it is a danger. Uh, it, it's not going to become a danger. It is a danger. It's already shining, showing signs of the overheating. It, it's already showing signs of, of thermal distress. Uh, as it stands, what can happen? The plastic may melt back a bit. The conductor is going to get hot. Uh, but all you need is a bit of uh, dust in the bottom of the consumer unit uh, that, that could smolder and, and before long you could get uh, a consumer unit burst into flames. So you want to me, yeah. yeah. Okay, and we've got another one from Lucian who's asking, um, with regards to reverse polarity with the line to neutral on a double socket in a hallway, is there a scenario that is code one or is it always a code two? To me, I put it down as a C2. Uh, it, it's not a problem as it stands, uh, in the fact that it will work perfectly well. The the problem ensues that um, you've got a possibility uh, of somebody uh, pulling out the fuse, disconnecting the circuit breaker, and with the wrong polarity, of course, the neutral remains live. The piece of equipment that's plugged into it. Um, it could still be energised, people could work on that piece of equipment plugged into a socket uh, and of course a shock will ensue. Uh, so as it stands potential danger, yeah, um, only if somebody decides to go about maintaining the, the piece of equipment that's plugged into the socket. I suppose additionally with uh, the reverse polarity you could also refer it as a further investigation in order to de determine where the cross polarity occurs, which again would be an unsatisfactory um, outcome. Great, thank you. Um, we've got some more. So green rather than yellow green, and uh, with the consensus of not needing to allocate a code, would you refer to it at all in an EICR? My personal opinion, yes. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm one for 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 putting things on a on my. Um, I know it's a period of inspection before that. I have my eyes here. Uh, so, yeah, you can see how old I am. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I try to note down most things. I, I will bring it to the customer's attention, uh, state to the customer that it is an older set of colour codes. It doesn't comply to the current standards, which is, is obviously uh, a brown, blue, green, and yellow. Uh, but I would, I would just state that it. There's no action really needed, but I'm putting it down just so you know I've noticed it. Yeah. Great. And um, with sockets being too close to the work surface, so this is in relation to that picture that you showed with the the flex being really tight on the on the worktop. Um, somebody's asking, uh, will rotating the socket by 50% be adequate in this instance? Uh, to, to me, no. I do apologise, but to me, no. If if you rotate the socket, uh, then obviously the socket is is in the wrong position. Uh, the flex is coming out the top, uh, and the top uh, horizontal surface is then not IP4X, and therefore uh, dust, wires, material can can go into it. So the answer is no. No, it should it should stay in the same in the position that it was designed to be in. And we've got a question from, from Jan who's asking about the test issues around um, new technology and the use of microwave sensors. Have you got any advice with regards to that? Any, any issues you know about or how to uh, overcome them? 
In microwave sensors, yes, it depends on what the question really relates to. Are we talking microwave sensors in such as um, burglar alarm systems or are we talking microwaves uh, in information technology and communication? Uh, so without a little bit more on the, the question, uh, then please get in touch with the technical helpline uh, because as an APIT member you're allowed to do that, of course, and we could answer it on that. Great, thank you. Uh, we've just had one come in from Stephen asking about crossed polarity at a socket and um, puts the fuse into the neutral and therefore the appliance becomes dangerous and a fire risk. Is that a code two? Yeah, yeah. As, as explained before, it's the cross polarity again. Uh, it will cause uh, a problem uh, if anybody decides to, to maintain the equipment uh, plugged into the socket. Uh, with the um, the neutral disconnected for all intensive purposes, the equipment seems to be dead. Uh, but because it's it's the wrong way and connected up wrongly, uh, the the obviously the internal parts of the machine, uh, the appliance, are still still live, uh, and you're leaving yourselves open to uh, possible electric shock. Great, and we've got we've just got time for a couple more questions. So uh, Matthew's asking if an installation has no RCDs present but is in a good condition, does it warrant a C1 or a C2 on an EICR? It, depends, yeah. it, depends, it really depends on where the socket is being used, to be quite honest. If the equipment could be used, equipment outdoor, it would have to go down as a C2. Uh, if, uh, as, as stated previously, it was um, on a second floor, third floor, with no chance of equipment being used outside, it could go down as a C3. And uh, Jeff is asking, um, or is saying that most of the EICRs that he, he carries out are on buildings in, in, in use where insulation tests are not possible due to live circuits. Um, and they, they just put NA in the MOHM charts. Is this the correct way to do this, question mark? Use your limitations. Every, every periodic inspection that you carry out, you fill out your EICR, uh, and there's a, a place for... Uh, documented evidence of limitations. Um, extent is what you do, uh, how much you've tested, so the extent of the installation goes in there. The limitations may very well be that you can't get to any circuits, people don't want you to switch off circuits. It, it could be the fact that you're working in a very large property uh, and you can't do a ZE. To do a ZE you've obviously got to make the installation um, dead to, to remove the earth and conductor to, to do the ZE, uh, and therefore that might not be carried out. If, if there's a reason you can't do anything, uh, it needs consultation with the person ordering the work uh, as to why it can't be done, uh, and then put it in your limitations and just record it as a limb uh, in your test schedule, inspection schedule. Uh, I'd always say, if, if ever you do have any limitations when you're carrying out a periodic report, always record the information in the report that way it can be seen as documented as to why certain tests may not have been carried out or certain circuits may not have been isolated for whatever particular reason that may be. But so long as you have recorded that, you, you'll be pretty much covered. Great. So a uh, final question of the evening then um, is from Charles. And he's asking, uh, a block of flats which has a 10 millimeter square bonding to gas and water at point of entry, but not within the flats themselves, what code would this be? <laughs> if it's not in the flat themselves, um, I would put it down as a C3. Uh, Primarily because as long as you can prove that the the installation pipe work is continuous throughout using an R2 continuity test, uh, then at least it is bonded. Uh, it's not bonded in the flat itself, which which needs a an observation put in on it. Yes, uh, but to me C3 uh, uh, and make sure that uh, you've put down that you had tested it and you was happy with it. Great, well thank you very much and um, thank you for everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I hope you found it useful.
Um, there will be, um, and we got through as many questions as possible in the time scale. Um, I hope the handouts um, within, with, to the right hand side of, of the screen will be helpful to answer any, question, any more questions you have. Um, and just to say there is a short survey at the end of this webinar and we really appreciate um, your feedback on, on what you enjoyed um, and, and what you didn't and, and whether you'd attend again. Um, so um, it's bye from me and thank you. It's bye from me, uh, and thank you very much as well. Can I just add that obviously the technical helpline is available if you have any queries. Please ring. Yeah, so thank you very much for attending, and please be nice in the survey. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Good night.